to the horror hour. All right. Hello and welcome to the Horror Hour, uh, the place where we discuss, debate, and disagree on all things horror. My name is Yutaka. I'm one of the hosts. And then I'm also joined with my other co-host, George. Hello. That's very butch of you, George. Thank you. You're welcome. I try. <laughs> and then we're also joined today with a special guest, uh, Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Reddick. Hi. Yes, don't call me Mr. Ah, it just <laughs> happens. That's so <laughs> formal. <laughs> Well, you know. But, no, you can uh, call me whatever you want. I don't care. <laughs> and so uh, we're really excited because, one, we've got the creator of Final Destination series here with <laughs> us. But also there are others, um, credit or other films to his credit, such as The Call, Final Wish, which I really am actually a big fan of, um, and which I didn't realize until looking at it. I've seen Tamara as well. Um, don't look back and then you've got the new Netflix series but I really am going to circle back around to the Usagi Chronicles at the end because I just saw that screenshot that they um, released and that looks well stunning yeah yeah I did all of it I wrote it I did all the art I'm I, I, <laughs> I just I just wrote on it I'm but excited I'm really, it looks really cool <laughs> oh and, no I'm really <laughs> excited about it too like my, my Japanese ancestors were like, I'm going to watch that. And so, but all right, we'll, we'll get back to this. So um, let me bring up my list of questions as we just sit here and banter. Okay. <laughs> so, well, um, I guess first off, uh, one of the things I thought it was interesting because uh, just trying to find, a, find some details, which I didn't realize, um, I guess you were a fan of A Nightmare on Elm Street and how you really kind of got into the horror, well, actually just the movie industry in general. Yeah, yeah. No, that's my favorite movie. So of the originals, I like my favorite. Wow. That makes sense. Love Wes Craven here. Yeah. yeah, we do. Um, grew up on, mm. But what I thought was very interesting, the fact that, um, I mean, nowadays, let alone to get access to talent, uh, the fact that you were corresponding with the head of a studio, I mean, because that's pretty impressive. And I'm just curious as about the journey to create, well, your um, prequel and just to that process. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a funny story and it, it's definitely a story of, it, of its time. I'll never tell you how old I am because it's, <laughs> I don't look good. So that's all that matters. But, um, you know, I saw a nightmare on the street when I was 14 at the drive-in and, you know, you know, I'm this 14 year old, you know, hillbilly living up in the hills of Eastern Kentucky. I know nothing about the horror business or the movie business, but I, you know, just went home and I banged out. A, I fell in love with the movie, fell in love with Freddy Krueger, fell in love with Nancy, fell, just the whole movie is just brilliant. And so I went home and banged out a prequel that only a 14 year old writes. So it was the <laughs> most obvious prequel in the world. You know, high schoolers, Freddy Krueger's a pervy janitor. Um, <laughs> They find out he's like molesting and killing people and then the parents kill him. So it's pretty much what you would expect a 14 year old to come up with. But um, yeah, I, I found out the address. I keep saying email, um, but <laughs> the address for Bob Shea in New York. And I mailed it to him and he sent it back because it was unsolicited. You know, they it didn't come through an agent and I didn't even know what that meant. So I looked it up and I was like, oh, that's what I knew. I learned a new word today. And then I wrote him back an email because it was a hillbilly. I mean, I'm like, look, sir, I've spent $3 on your movie. So I think you can spend five minutes to read my story. And um, he got, you know, I wish I was that ballsy now because that, that chutzpah gets out of you as you get older. The world beats it out of you. But um, yeah, he got back to me and his, him and his assistant, Joy Mann, um, who's no longer with us, unfortunately, but she, amazing woman. But they stayed in touch with me and they would send me movie posters and scripts and I would write script, you know, this was again, back yeah. when, you know, New Line was, you know, New Line's known as a house that Freddie built. So New Line was becoming a major studio at that point. But I think I got them at that sweet spot where, you know, Bob would read his mail um, and, <laughs> and 
they had enough time on their hands to to deal with this this wacky kid that was writing them and i would call joy up and talk to her and um yeah so i you know i acting was always my dream you know growing up and so i went to i studied uh theater at Berea College. And when I was there, I got a summer internship at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. And when I went to New York, they gave me an internship at New Line and um, for the summer. And I found, I went and found the coverage and all the scripts that they told me were really good, but I just should still work on my craft. And the coverage was like, this is awful. I was like, oh, I'm glad they didn't tell me that. <laughs> um, and so, you know, non-traditional or diverse casting was just not on the radar in the in the early 90s like literally true. if you weren't white um unless you played my agent literally said if you rapped or played basketball i could cast you but you're kind of like an ethnic michael j fox you know you're, you're like the boy next door but you're dark and they just don't write roles for that you know for that type of character which was true so instead of being like oh i'm gonna quit hollywood which is what a lot of people do when they get news like that i'm like well fuck it i'll just write stuff and be in it but, you know, obviously by the time I wrote Final Destination, it's like I couldn't pass for a teenager unless it was on the CW, maybe, you know? Yeah, <laughs> this is true. That's I true. There's nowadays, nothing wrong yeah. with that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I ended up working at the studio for 11 years and, you know, they, you know, made my, they made Final Destination. So it was a, it was a journey, you know, 20 years in the making to get it made. Um, but it was, a, you know, it was definitely, I, I love the story and I love that Bob took, you know, took, took, took a liking to me when I was younger and, and encouraged me and brought me into New Line and enjoy it as well. And um, yeah, I actually stayed like, this is how much of a creature of habit I am. I, I sold this, the story in 97 and wrote the script. The movie came out in 2000. I sold the sequel story I was still working at New Line and finally my boss is like, we love you, Jeffrey, but you're a big boy. <laughs> he didn't say it that way. He's like, but you're a real writer now, dude. Like you've sold two <laughs> things. Like you need to go do your profession. So they, they, they gently kicked me out of the nest finally <laughs> because cause I would have just stayed there. And, and it, I was working in New York. So I was in their corporate office and not out here where I am now in Los Angeles. So I wasn't in the Hollywood office, you know, kind of doing the networky stuff. So um, yeah, I, I finally, they, you know, clinging on to New Line, I was like, all right, I'll leave. Um, and then after 9-11, I said, I, I got to get out of New York and I finally came to LA. So, and the rest is history. I'm going to be known as the guy that created Final Destination and that'll be in my grave. <laughs> and that's pretty much, yeah, that's it. That's my life. It's an iconic thing to be the creator of. Oh, no. Yeah. And and I only smile about that because, you know, I'm still like a huge horror fan. So and, you know, read Fangoria and read, Blood, you know, like I'm, I'm still like so deep in that world that it's not lost on me. You know, it, it you know, you for, I forget. Well, I, I don't anymore because I literally probably get a log tr truck meme or picture every other day. <laughs> which I love people, people are like, Oh, you must get sick of seeing this. I'm like, no, it feeds my soul. <laughs> um, so to have a film like have that kind of impact, um, in the genre, like I could die happy tomorrow. I still want to do some other stuff and I definitely don't want to die. I do want to die happy, but I definitely don't want to die anytime soon. But if, if I, if I, if that was on my grave, I would be very, grateful to have that on my gravestone it's... that would actually be kind of funny final destination <laughs> <laughs> oh I, I mean i will never drive behind a log truck to this day ever ever i think i've probably ever. saved a lot of lives honestly like i think uh -huh. I, should, I deserve a like a, a medal of honor because i have probably saved lives and nobody gives me credit for that that was so like, <laughs> They're like, oh, you traumatized me. I'm like, oh, but I saved your life. <laughs> like, where's the gratitude? I'm going to call up Biden and be like, give me a purple, I mean, not a purple heart, but so, not that. That, yes. But yeah, give me one of those presidential medals of something. Yeah, I agree. It's a, um, I, I have, I love Final Destination. It's one of my, well, my mom introduced me to the series because she's a big horror fan and she always, um, loved. So I watched like the, the first two, which I, I'll never forget. Like the original ones, I'll just, they're both just those what two 
great, especially the bit I remember always being just as a kid making me feel sick was when um, she gets her head cut off in the elevator doors. And I was just like that with those hooks, <sighs> never. But I remember me, we were, me and my friend were obsessed with this series. And when we were maybe 14, 15, and we really wanted to be like, yeah, he wanted to be like a um, film, like a director or a producer. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to be an actor. And so we came up with this really bad, at the time it was Found Destination four because the others hadn't come out at that point um and we had like our parents film like this really bad version of Found destination where my mum got blue she touched a um the tv and she got blew up and my mum's friend slipped um and like cracked her head open then we thought it'd be really funny if she started peeing in the air she was it was it was a lot we the idea yeah, was gonna, the... you realize you're gonna have to send this to me <laughs> or I, will not, I will find it. I the will opening not finish was, his interview if you don't send it to me. The opening scene was set in a McDonald's, and basically the fat fryer went off and it melted the sea. <laughs> okay, you've got to send this to me. That's all. That's, that's awesome. okay. I'll have to find it. It was very. Okay. I mean, it was like we wrote like bullet points for only fourteen, fifteen. But yeah, just but anyway, that was the tangent. But I just had to say like how much of a great series it was. But I wanted to ask, obviously. It, from what I'm aware, did it not originate as sort of an idea for an episode of X Files called like Flight 180? How did it go from that sort of idea to it becoming like this huge blockbuster that that it is? Yeah, well, I wrote it to get an. I wrote it as an X Files. The I, I used the idea as an X Files script to get an agent. So I never <laughs> actually submitted it to the X Files. Like that's right. one of the that's one of the things that's kind of gotten like lost in history. They're like, oh, it was a rejected X-Files script, but I never actually submitted it to the X-Files because um, one of my friends, Mark Kaufman at New Line was like, this is a great idea for a movie. Like you shouldn't, you should do this as a movie. So I thought about it and then I wrote a, a treatment for it um, as a movie. And then one of my other friends that worked at New Line, Chris Bender, started working for Warren Zide and Craig Perry, the two producers on the project. And, um, they had a deal at New Line and they were looking for horror stuff. So I sent them over a couple of ideas and they really sparked to this one. Um, and we developed it, you know, because I knew that since I worked at New Line, they would kind of see me as like that guy that has worked here for a long time um, <laughs> and, and not as a writer. So I went and got it, producers attached to it. Uh, but it was still a really tough sell because they kept saying, well, we don't understand how you can have death as a killer. Like you can't see it, you can't fight it. And we're like, that's the whole point. Um, yeah. So they were, they, it was a tough sell. Like people, people were like, oh, it's such a great idea. Like we wish we'd have thought of it. It's like, we, I was working there and, and they almost didn't buy it. We were finally like, well, we're going to go to Dimension if you pass on it. And they're like, we'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it, 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 as you know, as it, it's very interesting though, because James Wong and Glenn Morgan, who did some of my favorite episodes of the X-Files actually were brought out to direct and they rewrote this, did a rewrite on the script. Um, so it's, it was kind of karmic in a way. Like I remember when Bob came up to me at New Line, I was like, Hey, what do you about these James Wong and Lynn Morgan guys? I'm like, Oh my God, they have done some of my favorite episodes of the X-Files. So that, and that would just be kind of cool. Like that's kind of a cool sign that, you know, it's kind of started there in my brain and now X-Files people are on it. So. Wow. That is cool. <laughs> So then, uh, just by hearing that as well, I guess, was your version darker than the version that we saw in theaters or uh, that we've seen? Yeah, my, I mean, I, the the biggest difference, and I'm actually really glad that they did this, is uh, James and Glenn came up with the Rube Goldberg kind of angle of, of it, where, you know, something falls into something. Um, in my version, since death, because I was, again, not a very Nightmare on Elm Street. Sure. Earth here. In my version, since death, didn't kill them the first time it couldn't come just come back and kill them the second time so it kind of tormented them with like these it very messing with reality in a very nightmare on elm street way where it tormented them with their secrets and, until they killed themselves which is obviously Ooh. a lot darker oh yeah that's, <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. that's so actually... Ooh. yeah no it's it's a, i really love the script but i i think it would have appealed very, it would have appealed to the hardcore horror audiences. Mm -hmm. And I think the version that James and Glenn did is more, it is still gives all the horror fans what they want, but I think it just appeals to people who aren't traditional horror fans, mm -hmm. you know, because they like, they like it because it, it's not a person murdering people. It's like glass panes falling on people and logs and stuff, which is, you know, still gruesome to watch. But I, th I think it broadened the appeal of it. And it also, um, 
Yeah, I think it just broadened the appeal of it because it made you start looking for things around you. That's such a true. And and so in your original, obviously, um, and we'll talk about it a bit more later on, you've obviously done a lot with the icon Tony Todd. Um, and obviously he starred in a numerous amounts of the foundation. Not enough for my liking, but not enough still, for anybody's liking. No, it's not um, all of them. Yes, <laughs> every single one. Every but, single one. Um, was his character so did you was he originally in your do you still have that kind of character in your script and did any of you did was tony always the idea for it or was that something that just gradually happened along with with the process of the film and and is he death there well (laughs) there i'll answer all those questions um there it there was a version of that character in my script but it was somebody because you know they always say when you're writing you know a script you have to you know like why is this happening to this person and why now so in the original script, the idea was that Alex had the premonition because he wasn't supposed to die on the fl- plane, but by getting the other people off, they were all supposed to die. So he doesn't realize this till the very end. So in my version, the Tony Todd character was actually someone who was kind of like Alex, but older. He'd been something like this had happened to him years ago. So he was like the creepy guy that was like following them around and they thought maybe he was killing them. And then they find out that he you know, he had been through what Alex had been through. So that kind of morphed into the Tony Todd character. Um, I I love Tony Todd. I saw like, you know, just love him. He's an amazing actor, amazing man. Um, So when they taught, when they told me they were going to cast Tony Todd, I was like, are you fucking kidding me? (laughs) Candyman is going to be in my movie. Um, so yeah, so I adore him. We're still really good friends today and I hope to work with him so much more. But um, as, to your last question um, that everybody always asks, there will probably maybe possibly never be an answer to that because I think in the original, because things do evolve, I think originally, you know, when James and Glenn kind of reimagined him, him he was just somebody who worked obviously close with death because he was, you know, at a, you know, a Mm -hmm. morgue, but, and they wanted to keep him mysterious, but I don't think you'll ever get the answer because I think people always want to, that's part of the thing is like, is he, I don't, yeah, I don't ever want to give an answer because everybody's got their own opinion on, on who he is. He's He's very death adjacent. If he's not death itself, there's definitely something going on there. I'd love to see a movie where they kind of dug more into his character. Um, yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah, he's just, cool. I think it does really, that's, and that's the, yeah, the thing, that's why he loves the character so much because he just comes in for like short bursts and you're just like, how does he know this? Because I think, yeah, in the first one, you're right, he does really just seem like this guy who works long death and just kind of seen it. But it's that second one when he says to her, you need to look for the signs, Kimberly. And she says, how do you know my name? And you're just like, oh my God, how does he know her name? Anyway. <laughs> I just have to get that out of there. Oh, yeah. So he's always, he's going to, you know, hopefully, you know, again, like I, I think he should be in every, every one because he's just amazing and the fans love him and he adds an element of like otherworldliness to it. I think anytime he's attached to a project, I, I feel that uh, you're just immediately like, oh, continue please do tell i mean because there's always just there's something about him i i love seeing him on screen and actually just watched the horror noir uh film that's going to be coming out and i i do i just anytime he's on screen i adore him um i actually um what you said earlier was very interesting and i think it's really good to talk about in terms of especially you know same as growing up I certainly, as a kid, was like, I wanted to be in the movies or in the movie industry. That was not the way my life took a turn. It was more of, oh, why can't you be a doctor and all this? And I was like, <laughs> okay, anyways. But the thing is the fact that we did, I didn't see myself represented. So it was very interesting that you had made that comment and kind of talked about it because thankful, I would like to say now, hopefully, we're seeing better representation because I truthfully growing up I didn't see a lot of um well even now really I don't see many Asian Americans in horror as much as I would like to um we're finally seeing more uh queer characters um yeah. played by queer uh talent as well which I'm grateful for uh because I I mean horror is queer but 
Um, and honestly, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that the people that have been creating horror this entire time are queer and they just don't realize that. And I just think it's interesting that now it's finally being represented. Yeah. And I keep thinking of Fear Street because of that. I'm like, yeah. that was a major push. But um, so I, I, I like that you called on that. And just it was interesting to hear that, you know, it's, you kept persevering, though. I was like, OK, I'm going to study and figure something out for myself. And right. so I, I think it, it's it takes a lot not only to get into the industry, um, but you are still consistently working and um, creating new projects. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to bring up because people, you know, anytime there's any kind of progress, people push back on it and people have a very short memory span. I mean, this was the, this was the nineties when I, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about like 1800s yeah. you know, or, or 1920, this was like 1990s. Um, and literally like I, I wrote characters of color in the first film because it was set in New York, you know? Mm -hmm. And that New York's a diverse city. And we ended up casting, you know, all white actors. And I adore all of them. They do a great job. But I'm like, I had from the beginning was like, we just, I just want it to look real. Mm -hmm. And what people don't realize is that unless you specify an ethnicity, the default in everybody's head is white, first of all. And when you, especially when it's leading characters, like a leading man or a leading woman, they will, they just, even when I've written characters of color in my scripts, they'll just meet all white actors. Like that was the default for such a long time um, in this business. And this business has been around forever. And it's been the default up until almost recently where you start yeah. seeing people of, of color like being the leads in a, a film. And now that people are pushing for diversity, there's that, you know, there's always again that pushback where, you know, and my mom is white, so I can say this, <laughs> um where white people were like you know now you're discriminating it's like it's not you're not discriminating it's just you you had this whole talent pool that mm -hmm. you never bothered to look at or even looked at and you're actually finally looking like oh there's a there's a whole other talent pool that we've been ignoring for a hundred or 200 years um we're gonna let's look in that and find the really good talent in that pool too because that represents the world that we live in and so it's a, it's a very, it's, it's happening now in a very, and it's very great that it's happening now, but I'm also seeing a lot of the pushback um, where people are like, oh, now, you know, because, you know, it's, it's just people are getting that kind of knee jerk defensive thing. It's like when women started getting, getting rights, men started getting like, well, you know, <laughs> what about us? And it's like, well, you, you got the right so far. And, and people think people, think diversity is that the movie industry is now going out and finding like inferior talent that you know is of color or women or gay and taking jobs away from talented white straight white guys and that's not what's happening it's like they're finding really talented writers directors mm -hmm. actors and actresses of color and uh, women and direct you know and that are good and giving them a shot where they had no shot before like and if we just if if we didn't have such short attention spans and didn't realize how recently it was impossible, you know, to get like a black lead in a movie unless it was like about gangsters or mm -hmm. you know a pimp, um, you know, it would be it would be an easier conversation to have today. But it's you know again I I just see a lot of the pushback where people are like ah what you know. I, I'm, I'm gotta be about you. black. It's like, it's an everything. It's, it's when you're not used to seeing a black lead in a movie and then you see two black leads in a movie, it may feel like everything's about being black, but it's not. And, you know, I've had all gay characters that were just de gayed in my scripts. Um, you know, we'll get to Tamara at a point and I have, I have a story about Tamara, which annoys the crap out of me, but you know, this, this was in, you know, again, this was recent. It's like, you know, now we're finally getting to, to a world that reflects the world that we live in. Um, and it's scary to some people that are used to the status quo. Sorry, I didn't mean to get off on it. No, I love that we're talking. Honestly, it's, I think uh, it's a conversation and uh, I, I will always be, I mean, I love that this conversation right now, just because it was something growing up for me as well. Just 
I wanted to see myself on screen. And the fact yeah. that it, we're just now in terms of, I mean, there's always been this great talent out there, but I, I would say just from, you know, my, I wouldn't even say my generation, because I mean, I grew up on Nightmare on Elm Street. And I mean, I was, what, I was six when I saw Alien and I shouldn't have, but you know, either way, that's neither here nor there. But, um, you know, I look at like what Black Panther did in terms of just the cultural relevance aside from having the talent, but how much it did at the box office and finally let people realize like, hey, these projects can do well. And so you're just seeing more of that. And I hope it continues, even though I completely agree that there is that pushback and it sucks because I would love to see, you know, a horror film with maybe a, a, a gay Asian lead, maybe not bearded, because I get that we're rare, sure. But, <laughs> you know, I would still like to see something to where I'm like, that's kind of cool. And honestly, it was very, this past year, I would say they're, even though they haven't been like, well, except for Shang-Chi, there's still been other Asian led projects that have been on the big screen. And it's just kind of cool to see that. And they've done well. And that's, and that's the thing is we're, we're in a business that's about money, first of all. Mm -hmm. But what's frustrating is like, I had this conversation after Black Panther came out with some investor guys who were talking about, you know, people won't go see it. I'm like, Black Panther is the blackest movie I've ever seen. Like from the costumes, to the characters, to the music. It, and it did better than most Marvel movies. And they're like, yeah, but that was yeah. a Marvel movie. But I'm like, but it did better than almost every, like, I think it's like number two or something like that. Mm -hmm. or even, it's it did better you know it's it's not just that it's a marvel movie it did better than most marvel movies and the same thing with shang chi like it's it did phenomenal and crazy you know rich eight like those movies did phenomenal box office and it's not just people of color that go see those movies like I, a lot of my white friends saw black panther and loved it you know what i'm saying it's like they you know and it's just again the default in hollywood has always been you know pretty straight white people. And yeah. again, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> There's a part, again, I'm part white. So, you know, that's in there and I'm, I'm kind of pretty because I have Vaseline on my camera lens. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's just people want to see, not only do people want to see themselves represented, which we do, but audiences want to see things that are interesting to them. And every, they don't have to see, they can see you can see white people, all, you know, it's not like you have to hunt for movies and TV shows that feature <laughs> white people. So it's not like the, the that white people have to worry so much about, it would be nice to see somebody like me. Mm -hmm. um, and on the gay actors, because I know there's always this kerfuffle about, you know, it should be the best actor, that which is always the default when they find a really great gay actor, but they're like, ah, oh, but this, you know, the straight guy's got, you know, he's more popular. So they'll always say it's, <laughs> The best. And it's the same thing. It's like they, the argument, the pushback is always like it should be based on merit and absolutely should be, be, be based on merit. But that's like saying there are no great black writers out there, you know, like all the great black shows in history. Most of them have been written by older white men. And it's like so you're that's just true. so you're saying there just weren't any talented black writers at the time. Of course, there were nobody just bothered to look for them. And I think that actors should be able to play whatever role they can. Um, but too often gay actors are marginalized because it's like, you know, and they have to stay in the closet or, mm -hmm. and for me personally, like if I, if I do a gay, if I cast a gay role, I'm going to find the best gay actor for it. Because honestly, with straight actors playing gay roles, you have to listen to their press junkets where they always have to bring up their girlfriends and how their girlfriends <laughs> were so supportive of them doing the role. That's true. And it's this, and then it, then it takes away from the movie experience for me. It's like, you know, when you play a serial killer, you don't have to go, well, I don't murder people <laughs> all the time. And, you know, and everybody's so happy I don't kill people in real life. So for me, it's, it takes away that, you know, like, yes. Anyway, I'm talking about a lot of stuff. At the same no, I, I, I really, I, it's just nice to hear that the conversation, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. So, George, I'll let you take that next question because I, I took us on this tangent, but no, I'm no, so happy we like talked about it because this like... was very, um, to me, this is just, it's nice to hear because it's nice to see somebody kept with it 
and again is succeeding and so it's yeah. just sorry george oh, follow that my my i know yeah my questions are like what was it like working on do you know what i mean no that's okay <laughs> oh they're all good questions no so but um so going back to kind of sort of just finishing off with sort of talking about found destination um obviously you sort of like set the tone for these characters and what their demise would be but in your version did you ever picture there being survivors from this film let alone there being a sequel where one of them pops up again yeah i kept um i kept alex alive and then clear you didn't see her die on screen, but they, I, I, I had the conceit in my script, which was actually in the original cut of the movie, but they took it out. Oh. Um, but you can see in the alternate cut where, you know, her and Alex, you know, have sex and then she has a baby. Mm -hmm. um, so in my version, Alec, Alex survived. Clear thought death had skipped her and that she was fine. But then we kind of had the ending in the, where she's giving, she gives birth. And then the camera kind of zooms through the emergency room and kind of comes into the hospital into her into her room but you never see her die so when i wrote the story for the sequel i actually brought alex and and clear both back um they weren't able to get out Al, um devon back for the sequel and they in my opinion just kind of wrote him out in the stupidest way ever <laughs> um but you know, since we never saw him get hit in the head by a falling brick, we just saw a newspaper article. In my reality, he's still probably alive. Um, <laughs> so I brought them both back in the for the sequel. I mean, just being a horror fan, you 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 never want to you never want to like just be cocky and be like, oh, the, there'll be a sequel to this. But you hope that there will be. So what you want to do, at least what I try to do, is I don't like to write an ending where like the killer pops up and jumps out at the lead character, you know, like, cause my feeling is if they've survived all this shit, I put them through in a script. I want them to at least have a kind of a happy ending. Um, but I did want, I, I knew that if this movie took off that it could have a sequel. So I definitely planned for a sequel. It definitely took off. <laughs> yeah. It definitely had a sequel. <laughs> No, yeah, I like. Well, I love, I love Claire. I think such a cook. I mean, I love Ali Lata. She, she yeah. was like one of my favorite actresses growing up because I'd seen her in Final Destination, then Final Destination Two, obviously, and then she did Resident Evil and other stuff like that, obviously. But um, I thought she was such a cook, and I was so sad when. She, I mean, I know it would have been difficult to have her carry on through all of them, but I kind of, yeah, I was like, I, it was so cool to have her back. I wouldn't, yeah, and I would. The thing is, if I would have known that they weren't going to bring Alex back i probably wouldn't have done that but since they were both going to be in the film you know kind of the trope i'd wanted to turn on its head was to have a final guy instead of a final girl in Ooh. final destination so i kind of like i was thinking of him as kind of like my nancy my mancy i just made that word up it's stupid <laughs> just yeah just a little just pretend i didn't say that word but um so my, my idea that he was going to carry kind of he was going to be the nancy thompson of, of the franchise um so if i'd have known he wasn't going to come back i may not have did what i i wouldn't wouldn't have killed probably killed ali larder off but it's still it's still it's a powerful scene it's just yeah yes it is love it sorry you can go no i i also like to think that i could be the nancy one day yeah <laughs> as i see at the see that Elm street in the back corner it's again grew up on that film oh yeah um, well then let's kind of get to Tamara. It's been, I remember when it came out and it's been a while since I've seen it, but now, as you said, I, I would love to hear this story then, because I do remember, oh, I remember that scene that she had the two I, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Was that yeah. not intended? <laughs> no, no. Um, so what happened with Tamara? Um, and I, and I still, it's actually of, I, I, you know, it's one of my favorites outside of Final Destination. It's 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 at the top of the list. I, I don't know, you know, you never want to pick one favorite because then the other fans and filmmakers are like, what the fuck? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but personally, yeah, it's, it's one of my favorites because I, I wrote that movie to just be a fun, because I love Carrie, but I don't like that you have to wait till the last 20 minutes for her to get revenge on everybody. So I was like, why not just write like a fun movie where it's like sexy and, has all the stuff in it and it was a really r it was an r-rated film and once they started shooting it 
they started wimping out on a lot of stuff because in this in in the script chloe was coming out so she was a lesbian she was coming out um and then the her storyline kind of culminated with her parents showing up at the hospital trying to murder her and they were like well we can't afford the parents so we're just going to lose that whole subplot um oh. and i'm like okay so now when you watch the movie it, it is kind of interesting because you expect her and jesse to get together and they ever do but that's why um and then for the infamous guy scene because the whole thing is tamra uses the character's sins against them and the whole thing with these two guys is you find out that they had roofied and and basically date raped some girls and so tamra puts a spell on them and in the script she makes she has sean rape patrick it's like it's violent and it's a rape it's very clearly you know so nobody said lionsgate loves the script um the producers never don't say anything i'm like well i guess you know nobody's gonna have a problem with this and then i get a call the day before they're supposed to shoot and they're like well how much do you want us to show in this scene um <laughs> like how much you know nudity i'm like well it's not a sex scene it's a rape scene so just show whatever you if you were having a showing a, a woman getting raped just show that like it's it's not sexy at all like it's supposed to be awful and they're like okay and then they showed me what they shot <laughs> and i'm like what the fuck is this because <laughs> if you're watching the movie now and this was the reaction i knew it would get and the, this is the reaction that it got when people were reviewing it it looks like Tamara made them gay because they just start kissing and then they fall out of frame. And then the next thing, the girlfriend comes in and they're under the sheets. She pulls the sheets back out on, they've got their shirts on, like who the fuck gets under the sheets with and keeps your shirts on and they're kissing. So it completely took away the horror of what they'd been doing to girls and that being put on them. And it was because they were, everybody was nervous about doing it. Uh, not everybody. Um, I think the actors were nervous about doing it, to be honest. And it just, it really pissed me off because it just, it gutted the whole thing. Well, yeah, that, that's interesting because now thinking about that, that would have made that scene, I actually would have made that quite um, horrific. Yeah, like it was supposed to, and that's the thing is, and now it's like a goofy it's a goofy, doesn't even make any sense. And then of course she has to kiss them too. She's like making out with them and pushing their heads together. I'm like, she, they rape women. She's not gonna, and they murdered her. She's not gonna make out with the people that murdered her. You know, and I, and I, I love the director. I think he did, actually did a really good job. I love how the movie's directed, but I think that's one scene where, again, it was just like, you know, and then of course, when she comes in and starts talking to Keisha, Tamara unbuttons Keisha's shirt and is rubbing her hands between her breast. Even she has a bra on, but rubbing her hands up and down her. I'm like, you guys are got to be kidding me. <laughs> like, anyway, that's my only because it it it's not just that. It's because now it makes the film like unintentionally like she made that she turned them gay as punishment for raping women. So that's their punishment, and I guess gay people just make out under the sheet <laughs> all their clothes on you know so it it that that really bugged me and that would that uh, yeah it makes a lot of sense now when you kind of get the full picture you can kind of say actually um how much more that would make <laughs> sense but never mind welcome to hollywood i suppose I they, they just <laughs> do that <laughs> but um also i um a film that I, one of actually a film that I really enjoy and which is based on a series that I really enjoy, um, which is of course um, George A. Romero's Of the Dead series. You of course penned the two thousand eight remake. What was that like diving into to the world of of the undead? And you said you liked the movie. You're one of the rare people that has. So it's I like... I actually liked the movie, no, and I'm happy to say. No, I think honestly. Um, <laughs> Two things. Well, first of all, um, I got to meet George. I was afraid to meet George Romero after I did the movie, not because of the movie, but because I was doing a remake in general. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm friends with Ken Forey from from the um, original. Um, and um, he literally dragged me over to George at a convention and was like, Jeff wrote the Day of the Dead remake and he, he's a big fan, but he was he's nervous to meet you. And George is like, 
oh, I hope it does well. You know, it's Hollywood. I don't, you know, that's great that you're working. So he was so nice. And I sat and talked to him for a long time. He's the sweetest guy in the world. But um, it was an interesting experience because that was a situation where they already had a director attached and they had like, they were going to make the movie. They just didn't have a writer. And it was Steve Miner was the director. And mm -hmm. I've loved a lot of Steve Miner's stuff like House and, you know, Warlock and the Friday the 13th and so to like so to work with Steve Miner was like holy fuck. Um, I knew going into it because I'm not stupid that I was no, no no matter how good the movie was I was gonna get fans angry one way or the yeah. other. But I'm like look no nobody else is you know if I don't do it somebody else is gonna do it and I want to work with George or Steve Miner and um, you know the, my only issue with that movie is that the what I signed on to write, because I wrote a very detailed treatment, was a very faithful kind of update of the movie. Um, and then through the development process, after I turned in the script, they started making me like change everything that was related to the original um, oh. intentionally. They're like, yeah, they were, they kept, they kept, well, uh, you know, we want to get away from the original. And I was like, no, like the, the fans are going to murder us. And they're like, all right, we, we care about the, you know, the, we, not if we make a good movie. I'm like, but you're not making a good Day of the Dead remake <laughs> if you're changing everything. So um, it, it was a it was a stressful experience once that part started, because I was trying to if you look at interviews with me from the time when I first got the job, I was like, the fans are going to love it. And then later on, when the film started shooting, I was like, it's a movie <laughs> um, <laughs> um, because I knew I knew they were changing it so much and they were taking it away from the original so much. I was like, we're going to get murdered. So, you know, watching it on its own, if it was just called zombie town, even though yeah. there's a zombie town, if it was a, just a regular zombie movie, I, it's, I think it's entertain. It's very entertaining. Yeah. If you're going in expecting a remake of day of the dead, it's not a remake of day of the dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, anymore, I started off with the best intentions. Um, but I, but, you know, I got to work with Steve Miner, um, had a great cast, got to, you know, Mina Savari, you know, Nick Cannon was awesome. Michael Welch, who I love, who was in the, the, the final wish as well. Um, so I got to work with some really great people. Um, and again, anytime I complain about stuff, it's not really complaining. I don't think, I think it's just telling the truth, but, um, I say that with a, knowing how grateful I are with a lot of gratitude that I'm able to, to make movies because I never want to, you know, cause I know people, I don't want people to be like, well, at least you're making movies, fucker. What are you bitching about? You know what I'm saying? Cause I know that that's a reality though. That, you know, again, like I, I could have just final destination could have been my only film ever made. Um, that's just, you know, that's more the rule than the exception in Hollywood is, is to make true a bunch of, so I, so I, I don't complain about the movies because I'm very grateful that I get to still make them. Um, the only time you hear me complain is if I feel like something like with Tamara, where I feel like the changes that they made as a gay person myself, or even if I was a gay person watching the film would impact me negatively when that was not what I wrote. Or like with Day of the Dead, where I'm sitting there the whole time going, the more you change it to a different film, it's going to piss people off and it, you're losing all this, all these threads and all these callbacks and Easter eggs and themes and, and they didn't listen to me and I was right. Now I've written stuff where they followed my script completely and people have hated it. And I own that shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I'm like, all right. So if I write a bad movie, I own it. But if somebody mucks my movie up, I'm like, yeah, they muck that one up. I would be the same. <laughs> I just love the honesty. Well, that's the only honest that because I always tell people like I'm an open book. I mean, it's it's good and it's bad. It's good. I don't give a fuck. Um, but that's why I tell people when they're interviewing, like, are there any subjects that we shouldn't talk about? I'm like, nah, you can talk about whatever because I just live. That's how I live life. You know, is just being honest, and I try not to be like vindictive or vengeful when I'm being honest about stuff, because there are stories I could tell that would be like throwing some bitches under a bus, but I'm not, I don't do that because, and you know, yeah, there's no reason, you know, to, to be that way. 
But, you know, I just like to be honest because it's a brutal business, you know, and people don't realize it. I didn't realize it when I, I mean, even working at New Line, I was like, oh, wow. I mean, I had a lot of scripts get past that New Line before Final Destination. So I knew it was not easy. You know, it wasn't super easy, but I was still like, you know, I still thought it was kind of like, oh, you know, all right, sold a, sold a, you know, a movie by the time age of 27. That's pretty, that's pretty damn good to a studio in this business. Um, so it's easy street from now on. <laughs> um, and it, and it's, and it's, and it's never, it's not been easy street. So, you know, that's part of working in a field where, you know, you don't have a regular nine to five job where, you know, you may find it boring to do the same job every day, but at least you have a steady paycheck and you have health insurance and, you know, you have your routine with us. It's like, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent next month. You know, my, my fucking sister love her to death. She thought I was a millionaire from Final Destination because she doesn't know how Hollywood works. And I'm just a writer. So she kept, she, she'd be like, can you pay off my car? Um, and um, finally she came out to visit me and she's like, you live in an apartment? And I was like, where did you think I lived? I thought you had one of those big houses in the hills. I'm like, girl, I told you I don't. <laughs> like, <coughs> Pay off your own damn car. <laughs> like, I'll buy you I'll buy you dinner at Shoney's or something, you know. Oh, wait, does Shoney's still exist? I don't I'm know. Sorry. Actually. I said that and then I was like, I don't know if it's still around. No, I didn't know what it is. It's yes, an American it's thing. Very American. It's a very Maybe American even Midwest. Thing. I, I don't know if that I I mean yeah, I remember there was like a Shoney's, like maybe yeah. I think it's a Hooters now around me. But... Probably. <laughs> That brings back memories. I used to go to their cereal bar all the time. Anyways. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh sorry, George. <laughs> you, you're missing out. That that truly was, that's a memory right there. And I love that. <laughs> um, <laughs> speaking of um, actually getting to work with other folks too, um, because I think it was Timothy Woodward uh, did the yeah. call and then did the final wish. And then those both also had Lynn Shea. Yes. And I thought that was, well, one, I, I, I adore Lynn Shea. And I'm actually, because I was didn't know who Timothy Woodward was, but it's like, I really enjoyed both those films. I really will say that um, The Final Wish was such a, you know, I, you know, they always, I will say they'll, they'll always tag on, oh, their creator found Destination. I'm like, okay. You know, you have like a certain, like, okay, well, I'm going to see something that I'm thinking to learn, you know, my, you know, it's going to scare me, but maybe give me a few laughs. Whereas that, I, when I went into it, I'm like, this is dark. Oh, I was like, oh, this is good. Got me some scares. And the whole, like, just the tone of that movie was very yeah. interesting. But I would love to know, well, one, about writing, how it was, you know, going about writing that and how much you were involved, but also then just working with Lynn Che because... Yeah. She just seems like you a true delight. You just want to hear about Lynn Shea. You're just pretending <laughs> to hear about that. Okay. Um, no, th the thing is, I, I actually, I wrote this, because I because when I worked at New Line, it, you know, you could sell treatments back in the day. Back in the good old days, you could sell treatments. So you didn't, and then they would pay you to write a script. Now they want you to fucking write the script and bring it, attach cast and do all this other stuff. So I had a bunch of treatments that I had written, and I'm like, there's no way I'm going to be able to write all these. So I actually partnered with two friends of mine, Bill Halfen and John Jonathan Doyle. And so we wrote the, we wrote the script and Timothy and uh, he's a, he's, he hadn't done horror before, but he had been hitting me up on social media. This was years ago. Um, and he's like, I'm a director, you know, and I didn't realize he also, you know, had financing for his own stuff. Cause you know, people will try to, I, I can't read unsolicited stuff. Um, this isn't, unfortunately I don't run a studio. <laughs> uh, I can't read out the list of stuff, but he would send me emails and be like, Hey, do you have any scripts available? Um, and so I was like, and I didn't at the time, but he finally sent me a couple of his Westerns that he did. And he's got such a great visual style. I, I mean, that you could tell that both movies were directed by the same director. He's got such a great visual style and he sent me the clips and it just so happens that we had finished the final wish. I think Timothy is like, yeah, Jeffrey's ignoring me till I send him my stuff. And then he's like, yeah, I've got something. But <laughs> I think it was, it was more that the seeing his stuff did make me want to work with him. But um, I was like, yeah, I've got this final wish. And he's like, well, um, 
I had a movie that we were supposed to start shooting in a month and it, I'm not, the script's not ready. So I'd like to shoot this. And I'm like, what a month? Cause usually you sell a script and it's like five years later, they're making it. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and he goes, I want to, I want to get Lynn Shea and I, I want to have Tobin uh, or Tony Todd. And um, I was like, well, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> because just be, because I, I I'm, I'm friends with Lynn. I adore her. Um, she's just busy. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like, she's, you know, she takes every project seriously. Like she's not somebody that, takes a paycheck and phones it in. Like she, when she gets she a, on a project, she commits, she does her work on the character. She brings ideas to the table that are always really good. Um, and I was just like, she's probably not going to do like an indie horror film. So I, the thing I learned about Tim is you never underestimate Timothy Wood <laughs> Jr. Um, <laughs> so he ended up kind of like really working hard to get, get her in the project. And, you know, they, her and her manager Gina passed on it a few times, and um, t then Timothy, you know, he's a southern southern boy too, so he wanted he sent fly he would send flowers and just you know keep trying to talk to her and stuff. And I and, and at one point I think Lynn emailed Gina but accidentally copied Tim, <laughs> and was like, I feel like I should just at least meet with the guy to thank him for whatever. And so Tim was on that email. So then Lynn. <laughs> Lynn had dinner with them, and by the end of dinner, she was like, "I'm on board." So <laughs> that's amazing. Um, and so it was amazing to work with her. And um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I'm, we worked with her on the call. I'm working with her on another project. Like I could work with her and Tony. Th those are two people, and it's it's rough, you know, you know, because you want to find you got to find the roles for them. Like that's the mm -hmm. thing. It's like my next movie is going to be. Um, a slasher movie that we're shooting in Europe, but all the young people are going to be people of color. And the way that I pitch it is it's like scream, but instead of focusing on all the pretty white kids over here getting murdered, you just move the camera over there and focus on those kids getting murdered. So it's not like about race. It's just about representation. I um, mean, there's a gay character. I, well, I just spoil it. Um, but we can, we can bleep that out. Yeah. You can, you can just say there's a gay character that bleeps and then that yeah. way people will be like, oh my God, wow. <laughs> um, so, you know, I can't obviously cast Tony or Lynn in that because, you know, they can't play high schoolers. But um, it was amazing to work with her. And yeah, j just the level, because at her, at the stage of her career where she worked so much, she could definitely be one of these phone it in people like send me the paycheck. I'll show up and say my lines and leave. And she's not like that at all. And Tony's not like that at all. That's why, you know, there are other certain actors, I think, that work a lot and people just admire them because they have been in the business a long time and they don't, they still take their work very seriously. And so to work with her was like so fun and to have Tony in that and then having Michael Welch back, that was actually serendipity that we got Michael in. Um, it just, he just happened to be available. And Tim's like, what about Michael Welch? I'm like, he was in Day of the Dead. I love him. Um, and he did a great job. So we had such a wonderful cast with that movie. And then Lynn actually brought the call to us. Like that was a project that she produced with Gina. So after working with Tim and I on The Final Wish, she came back to us. And of course she did our movie. We're not saying no to Lynn Jay asking us <laughs> something. Um, and that movie turned out to be a lot of fun too. Um, and now I told Tim, I was like, because he likes to do period pieces and Westerns. And he set the call back in the 80s, so he got his period fix in. But I told him, I said, once you do horror, you're going to be hooked, man, because they're fun to make, and you will never find a better audience, a better, more loyal, like, that's true, engaged yeah. audience. And so now he is, he's still doing other stuff, but he's like, yeah, I like doing horror a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to, hopefully we'll all be doing more stuff together. <laughs> I think that would be amazing. Well, I mean, I love horror, but yes, I will say Lynn Shay, the way she's able to just like quickly flip on a dime yeah. from it is, it gets me every time because I don't, I, I am a big fan. I, I love seeing her in either comedic roles or dramatic, but I just love when she's in horror. There's just something about it. Just my favorite. Yeah. yeah. And then, with um same thing with the call like i remember when we first started talking about the call that's what i love about tim too is he's like i'm gonna get tobin bell to work with lynn and then i'm gonna get chester rushing from stranger things i'm like 
Well, you did it last time, so I don't doubt you, but I'm just saying <laughs> you're planning on shooting this pretty quick. A lot of things have to fall into place to make this happen. And the fucking call sheet comes in, Tobin Bell, Chester Rushing. Um, I'm like, good job, Tim. <laughs> I will never doubt you again. Just perfect casting. I remember and when it was- Tobin and Lynn have, like, they should be cast in everything together because they have such a, it, amazing chemistry. And Tobin mm. has this huge fucking monologue in the call. And it doesn't feel huge because when you're watching it, it's Tobin Bell. And so he's captivating. So you don't, you're not looking at the clock saying, wow, this is, but he memorized that whole fucking monologue. And, you know, just Damn. every B, yeah, it's just crazy. Like the, the talented actors are just, you know, mesmerizing to watch. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, I don't want to sit here and gush all over Tobin and Lynn and Tony <laughs> Todd. Of, of course, Tony Todd always. And because then I'd start gushing on Devin Sow, who I love too. And I love Michael Welch. Yeah, I, I we've had a really, I, 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 I don't, I can't think of anybody who's ended up in our movies. We had to fire a couple of people, but I can't think of anybody who's ended up in our movies that I, that I don't adore because they've all been like, you know, from Jesse Bradford and Jocelyn Donahue and Brea Grant to, um, I, sorry, I love Brea Grant. Oh, and my so God. I, I, she, I've been on a, um, a horror film streak of hers and now to see that she's also writing and do it. It just, yeah. When we were on this, when we were on the set for um, Sleep No More, uh, we were talking and she was saying, you know, she loved it. She loves acting, but, you know, you don't have control of your career. Your, your career is at the whim of others. And she's like, you know, I really, I'm going to start producing and writing and directing. I'm like, do it. And she's doing it. I'm so proud of her. So proud of her. And she's just like, you know, I just like the good people. Like, I've been very blessed not to have to deal with any assholes who we didn't fire. Um, I'm not going to say who who it was. Don't worry, we won't ask. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, no, I'm not going to. But the good thing is we we ended up firing all of them. So <laughs> I haven't had to deal with any assholes on set and, you know, talent-wise. And that's been such a great thing. Because I actually, cause, just because I'm spoiled and I've never done it, I actually want to be directing a movie where somebody starts being an asshole and I fire them. Because <laughs> every time I work, I talk to producers and they're like, well, we're, you know, where they're having trouble or directors, they're like, well, we're afraid to fire her because then her or him because their agent will not work with us anymore. I'm like, fuck it. I will fire anybody. <laughs> They're being an asshole. Like, and I want to do it. I just want to have that experience once because I just don't think there's a, I, you know, it's a hillbilly in me. It's just like, nobody's better than anybody. So if you start bringing your kind of diva or whatever Duda, whatever guy's version of diva is to set, I'm just making up all kinds of words. I'm going to copyright these words. Do it. Do it. Actually, you'll see them in George's script later when he says yeah. that. <laughs> okay. I'm happy. If, I'm happy to role play as the as the person you fire if you want, because I can. I can. You can be a diva. Yeah. So I'll cast you for something and just be an asshole, and then I'll yeah. fire you. Okay. okay. Then I can okay. say I was fired by the. Yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> that would be my claim to fame. Well, I haven't got any more questions, actually, Taggy. We kind of went off on kind of a different tangent. I've been enjoying <laughs> this. I'm so sorry. This is kind of what we do here. We 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 have set questions, and then we go on these tangents, and it's actually been just honestly a true delight, and I probably could just sit here and talk to you about just a whole... Well, I live in the Midwest. We're practically Southern here. I mean, I think yeah. technically Missouri is considered... I don't know. There's parts of the Midwest that you can tell they wish they were Southern. They're like, we wish <laughs> you'd been fighting in the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> but we weren't able to. <laughs> I said parts. I didn't say all. So don't don't be getting offended, people. Also, I uh, again, I um, didn't do enough homework to see how um, well hilarious you are in interviews. This has been. I don't think I've laughed this much in one of our interviews. It's been very enjoyable. Um, also, just a, one I I want to highlight on that representation discussion because that was great, and I think. I can't wait now to hear that you're also doing a slasher and oh my gosh, that makes me happy. Yeah, and, and when I say people of color, like, the, you know, I'm very specific in my in the character breakdowns, like 
all, you know, there's a couple of roles where I definitely want like, you know, black and Latino actors, but then the other roles, it's like, I want, you know, Asian actors in Middle East, or I want the whole melting pot, like super quick. And then I have to plug something and then not, not that sounded awful. Um, oh, no. Yes. I, if you have something to plug, by all means. You, I mean, you know, go for it. Usually they ask me if very... I have anything to plug at the end. Oh, I was getting to that, but I, I'm seriously <laughs> fawning over you. That's, that's how oh. much I'm enjoying this interview. Like, it oh, is okay. Just... So I jumped a plugging gun. I should have <laughs> waited for, for, for uh, permission. Um, <laughs> Oh God, what was I going to say? I cracked myself up. No, I didn't. I embarrassed myself. So now I don't. Um, fill in the gap here. What were we talking about? Represent, the representation. Oh, it was it representation slashers. in slashers. Oh and... yeah. Like, but you know, I, but I, but I, I want to see like, like, oh, I know. I was going to say, go back and watch the first Spider-Man movie because that movie has the most diverse cast in the foreground and the background. And it's very true to New York, but it actually, when I was watching it in the theater, it actually made, even, I'm a person of you know color and it made me a little uncomfortable because I wasn't used to seeing it, you know? And if you go back, just go back and watch it. I will, it, it's one of the, my favorites, but I don't think in I the cafeteria scene, there's like, there's like some Sikh Muslims in the back, you know, or Sikhs in the background. There's like everybody is wow. at the school, which again is typical New York school. Yeah. But I remember watching the theater and the reason I think representation is so important is even I, somebody who craves seeing diversity, I felt a little uncomfortable because I wasn't used to seeing that much diversity in a big Hollywood movie. And so I'm like, this kind of uncomfortableness is because it's, it's not something I see, but I was like, maybe this is what white people feel like when they get angry about <laughs> diversity. Because I wasn't angry, I was just uncomfortable. And so usually when you get uncomfortable, people get angry. That's very true. I. I am going to have to go and watch it. I, I mean, I, I love that, but I don't think I picked up on that. But yeah. I, I will say, I mean, I, I live, you know, also, it's funny. I'll be like George for a second. Say, I actually was, I was born in LA, but I grew up here in Missouri. And yeah. it was very, you know, very white neighborhood. I can maybe only think of, aside from my twin, there was maybe only two other Asians at our school. Mm -hmm. And it's just so it's interesting that when I go to see movies, growing up, I still wanted to see me. But if I didn't, sadly, because, you know, my my mother's white at like, like blonde hair, blue eyes, um, translucent you know we just happen to be who we are i just i i never noticed that kind of thing so that's very interesting that's a shame that i didn't notice it when i saw that in theaters but I'm well, no but it's i mean it's a very fun engaging movie too so but i was just like because i was i i've been having these art you know trying to get my diverse slash movie on the ground so that was kind of i'm just used to to not oh it's like oh yeah they go they go in this school of 300 people they got two black people back there in the bleachers, <laughs> you know and one Middle Eastern person, and oh, there's an Asian person in the math class. There, that's original. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> love it. Oh, yeah. I it, I joke that I can't do math because of my mom. Since <laughs> <laughs> well, I joke that I well no no this is no I joke that the only black part of me that I that the only black trait that I got was my rhythm and my hair. So <laughs> yeah, so yeah, damn it. So I'll date a guy and I'll be like, you're my first, you know, first black I've ever dated. I'm like, well, you're, you don't check that box yet. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't quite. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, you know, this is me with a tan. Literally. Like if I'm like so pasty, if I don't get out in the sun, I'm like, yeah, don't, don't check that box off yet. Um, Love it. <laughs> George is like, I don't know what we're talking about anymore, but it's, oh my god. I goodness. think George knows what we're talking about. Yeah. I know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my um, god. I'm almost going to start tearing up because I'm laughing so much. This has really just been a delight. And um, before I ask if you're going to plug anything or what do you have to plug? Um, also, real quick on the slasher though, because... Yeah, people make that happen. Don't get me wrong. Oh, it's happening. Oh, I don't mind seeing, you know, you know, all the white people die. That that sounds terrible, but I watch all those stuff so I can see the pretty people die. That that truthfully, that's yeah. that's what I like to see. But I, I'm happy to hear that because, you know, I mean, us Asians want to be killed too. 
I know. Yeah, yeah. Who doesn't want to be killed in a slasher movie? I just want to be actually the Drew Barrymore. That's that that scene still gets me to this day. So you but. you want to be the showcase ten minute opening scene? Yes, film. that's all you want. Okay, Absolutely. That's, yeah, that's put me on the marquee. Much. Still, you know. <laughs> I want to I want to be on the poster and have a ten minute scene where I get to. <laughs> and I just want to be the school whore who gets killed yeah. in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's all we want, guys. That's, yeah. that's all we ask for here at the horror. Is school horror. horror? <laughs> yeah. so you're basically glory hole, George, in the bathroom at school. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I, oh, George, I'm going to refer to you as that now. Not on, not on everything, but that's too, that's too funny. That's, that, that's, that's going to stick with me. That's hilarious. Um, I don't even know how to transition from that because that's too good. But also, um, we all love Wes Craven, and that's why I just love hearing also this discussion. Oh, too. Yeah, he's a, I got to meet him too. He's a, the first, for, then I'll, yeah, then I know we got You got to him. meet him? I got to meet him, but it's so funny because we were doing that. I was part of the documentary, you know, The House That Freddie Built um, mm -hmm. that they did on New Line Cinema. And Wes Craven was coming in after me to interview and I was so, this was after I sold Final Dust. I w and I've met like up to this point, I mean, I'm, this is just true, but I mean, I'd met Morgan Freeman. I met Brad Pitt. I'd met like all these huge stars before then. No problem, just casually passing them and saying hi. I was like, I, I, I can't, they were like, just stay for 20 minutes and we'll introduce you to Wes. And I'm like, I, I can't meet him right now. <laughs> like I was just too, because we were just talking about Nightmare on Elm Street and it was, I, I can't, I'm still embarrassed by that story. So I, I thankfully, um, I at the last house on the left remake premiere, he was there and I had one of my friends introduce me to him and we had a very like pleasant, like 30 minute conversation. He's just everything you want him to be just very down to earth, very humble, very funny. Um, just adore the man. I can't believe I was such a like I could have met him like years earlier, but I was like, eh. <laughs> See, I'm just like regular people. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would, yeah. <laughs> well, transition. Speaking of glory holes, what else have we got coming our way from you, Jeff? <laughs> well done, George. Thank you. <laughs> well done. Um, well, if you if you if you want something right now, um, you can turn on Netflix. Um, I did my first foray into kids animation, um, and I wrote two episodes of this animated series called The Tale Dark and Grim that I'm extremely proud to have been a part of. Um, it's fairy tales, but it's dark, a little dark, but it's not, it's family friendly, but you, you guys will enjoy it. So I wrote um, episodes four and 10, but it is sequential. So you should watch the whole series so you don't lose track of stuff, um, but really proud of the show. And then um, also I had the pleasure of working with the same showrunners. Uh, they brought me over to work on um, Samurai Rabbit, the Usagi Chronicles, which, um, which um, is it's a spinoff of the Usagi Ojimbo cartoon. So it's, it's not a telling of the comic book story, but it's a spinoff that tells like a, a generation, a couple of generations are moved, but uh, very true to the spirit of the comic book. Stan was the creator was involved um, and has blessed the show. And I'm, that's going to be coming out at some point next year. Um, and I'm super excited about that one too, because um, I just, I just love the, the, I, you know, I, I love, you know, Japanese horror films and, and Asian horror films. I, I just love those. And, and also the comic book world is, yeah, it's, I'm very excited about for people to see that too. I just, I mean, I saw the image and I'm just like, oh, this, I love just anime and just anything that has just the same, I, well, obviously I love Japanese culture. So I'm really yeah. excited to see that. But uh, before you go, because we we normally have a, a, same, a typical question, but now I just have to ask instead, I'm going to phrase this. What's your favorite Japanese horror film? Um, I think the one that I, that hit me the, the strongest early, but it was the first one I saw was was Ringu. Um, just because I had never seen a film like that and it was amazing and it terrified me. Um, I think Train to Busan is Korean, correct? I, I no, that's. I want to yeah, say it's Korean. Korean. Yeah, Train to Busan is Korean. I, I, I'm ninety percent 
show. Yeah. So I, yeah. So I, I don't want to be racist. Um, so I had to make, I make sure that I'm just not lumping all the. Yeah. So no, Korean. I'm pretty sure. South, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. South Korean. But I think Ringu is my, is my favorite. Um, I like that. Because it just, it, you know, part, part of you, me can't separate the experience from the film. So I just remember I'd never seen a film like that. And it was so well done and so scary and new. Like, that's why I say that, that we want diverse storytellers. It's not just because we're checking a box off. It's like, it's interesting to, I mean, how many different ways can you tell a story about ki kids getting murdered in a, <laughs> an American high school? Like, yeah, you know, it's very like, true. <laughs> um, so that's my favorite. Yeah, Good Ringo's one. my favorite. George, do you have one? I already know mine. I since I asked, I... No, mine mine's Ringu too. Yeah, because I just remember that was the first, like again the first one I watched. Because obviously I'd well not unfortunately because I still do. The American one is one of the better American remakes of a, a yeah. foreign film. But so I obviously enjoyed that one, and then I was like, my friend was like, "Have you watched the original?" I was like, "Oh no!" And then I watched the original. And I was like, "I understand why now because this is absolutely terrifying." <laughs> so so yeah, mine mine would also be um, Ringu. Yeah, well, I'll throw mine. Mine's Audition. I yeah, you know, and I can see that being a, being someone's favorite because it's it's a good it's a good story. That's shady, oh. huh? <laughs> That's shady. I can see that being. Oh someone's no, favorite. I was no. What I was saying is no. Like, it's uh, what it's is, on um, my it's on my list. I didn't. No, I was not being. I was tr not trying to be cunty. I'm so sorry. Um, no. Um, but it, it's kind of. I guess it's a horror movie. It, I know it's it, it's, bot, it's yeah it's more mm. body horror I think um one of the interviews we did I love the way he phrased it it's like a romantic comedy until the end I'm like oh yeah yeah, yeah. it kind of is but it I just love it because that tension and that story and then it just goes bonkers at the end and I just I love it 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 really is but I do I I, I think um Japanese horror is one of my favorites and I hate most of the time when they do remakes. I will say, yes, The Ring is probably one of the better remakes, but I get, uh, I do get frustrated when I see those get remade because then people won't go, some will seek out the original, but obviously, um, you know, people are afraid of subtitles, sadly. Well, I'm, a, I'm surprised they haven't remade um, Audition, actually. That's the one movie that I was like, I don't, and I don't know if it's because, you know, Hollywood doesn't want to make a movie about a pr producer who's preying on women. I don't know if that's it. It's like, uh, mm. we, we gotta, yeah. I don't know if they can do that out. now. <laughs> but um, maybe I'll do a gay version of Audition. Do it. Hey. <laughs> I was thinking of another director. That's why I'm like, not gonna, ah. yeah, yeah, the, I almost, but I'm not, um, but I, you know, but I wouldn't do, yeah, no, that, anyway. Um, I have some other, one other thing to plug. Yes. Where I go. Um, Cause I directed my first film. Um, thank you, George, for acknowledging that. <laughs> I, was, I, was no, point, you, I was pointing at it in George the George is being shady now. See? No, Wait, it's well, yeah, in go the ahead. Background. It's in the background. I can see Oh, it is in the back. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you know what else I have? What have you? Hang on. Oh, he's in the corner. Gosh, it's mini me. <laughs> if both of you don't know what that is, then I, I do. do. Oh, that right, right now. I, I, um, George is well. Ben is our youngest member, but George is also younger. I'm I'm the oldest here, so I I'm, I'm going to be 26 that. on Halloween. I'm almost nearly, nearly time. You're for a kid. Away. You're a kid. Yeah, you're, George is like, is that a Hobbit? <laughs> <laughs> I need. Do you know I only know that guy because he was on British Big Brother and he got drunk one day. Um, and slammed oh. into the diary room door and, his, and it was so funny because he had a little because he can't walk he couldn't obviously walk I too remember far. well he did and that he was, here did yeah. he yes. he was iconic but yeah I do know because Austin Powers is a piss take of James Bond uh, yes is, absolutely oh. okay but um, sorry, anyway your your film your directorial debut yes um it's called Don't Look Back and it's now available on streaming and blah 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 pretty much streaming and blah 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 you can find it um and it 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 is interesting because for my for my directorial debut, I did pick one of my projects that wasn't straight up horror. Like it's I I hate because I I hate when people do horror films and they're like, well, it's not really a horror film. 
the only reason I'm saying it's not a traditional horror film is because you it's about some people who see somebody getting assaulted in a park and don't help and then something or someone's coming after them and killing them and you don't know if it's a killer or if it's supernatural until the end so part of that story it's more of a mystery because it's a it's a what's doing it and i couldn't show any of the people getting killed because you can't it would give away mm -hmm. if it's a person or something supernatural so you know people a lot of people went in expecting kind of a final destination which a we didn't have the final uh, you know we maybe had the final destination craft services budget for the film um but people going in expecting it to be like a fun bloody kill fest you know it's not that movie but i'm still really proud of it i think it's a really fun entertaining movie i love our leading lady i got to finally find the best actress who happened to be black um to be my leading lady and um it's just a really fun mystery movie. And so, you know, my next one's going to be my slasher, you know, blood flying everywhere film. But, um, but yeah, I'm really proud of Don't Look Back too. So um, if you haven't seen it yet, give it, give it a look, see. Do it, do it now. Do it now. <laughs> and I think I'm tired of plugging now. So, <laughs> um, I, <laughs> no. Um, any other questions? <laughs> just, I could just could we would say if we had his time, we'd sit here for another hour laughing. I really would, oh. and I don't want to keep you because I've we've actually gone over time. Yeah, I, yeah. I feel bad because I know time is time is precious. Um, well, more so. Money. It's precious. It's not <laughs> money. I wish time was money. I wish I was getting paid. Not for this. This. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> this this is our hobby, so I can't say anything because I have. I'm that person who has that nine to five job. Except yeah. obviously for right now, because I, I was like, I'll take some time off. We'll 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 have some fun. And honestly, I I do then full go to work and be like, ha ha, I got to actually interview somebody who's done something. <laughs> they've actually one of my friends was like is it an actual uh writer or an actual director i go yeah they're like do we know i'm like you're gonna know the next one dick but yeah i'll let him know later right, anyway tell, so tell i just dicks, to, oh tell the yeah. dicks that they're tell the dicks to like don't hate on you because you're doing fun stuff and george tell your mom thank you so much for taking you to see horror movies when she shouldn't have and i can't wait to see her die in this video that you're gonna send me <laughs> i don't see if i can find it no that's, it was from oh no I, you know it's you know yeah. it's around somewhere it's right? obviously well, i haven't i left yeah it's my friend who's got it because he was the filmer i was just the, the face obviously i can't um, you know what it. george will do a trailer reaction to this <laughs> we will put it out on the interwebs no yes. we won't <laughs> <laughs> Well, I uh, just uh, again thank you, uh, Jeffrey, for joining us. Um, of course, we had a blast, and I, I hope you guys did too. too. And we'll you have been listening to the Horror Hour. See you next time. <laughs>